1510. And the great Martin Luther, right? Raise your hand if you recognize that name. The great Martin Luther decided he needed to visit Rome. You think, okay, that sounds nice. Just a little jog down the street. No, no. He didn't go by horse or by carriage or boat or Prius. He hiked there 700 miles. That's like, I think Atlanta's like 600 miles. Okay, so like he walked past that and he didn't do it in summer. He didn't do it in fall. He did it in a winter, but not a winter of normalcy. One of the worst winters on record. Why? Why would he do that? His reason? You see, back then, most Christians believed they could only go to heaven if at the end of their life they had done more good than evil. Very common belief. It's a works-based belief. At the end of the year, you put your good works, your bad works on the scale, and you see which one wins. And most people felt that you would probably fall short when you stood before the Lord, and, and rightfully so. I would not want to earn my way to heaven like that. And so he was thinking, you know what? This is why God needs to purge us of our excess sins. Over a period of thousands of years, it's a place that they came up with called purgatory. Does it make sense now? Where the purging could take with thousands of years of misery while God is purging your excess sins. But to reduce your time in purgatory, people would try to pile up good works, especially as they felt the end was drawing near. And they would do things like venerating objects and holy relics, and they would pay homage to it, or they would make pilgrimages, or they would try to do penance and different things to show their repentance before God. So while in Rome, Martin Luther visited the reconstructed steps of Pontius Pilate's palace. Supposedly, these are the very steps that Jesus climbed on the day he was sentenced to be crucified by Pontius Pilate. And people, to this day, if you look closely, you'll see the stairs are literally worn away where people do this because he did this on his knees. And people still do it on their knees. But on every single step, he would stop while on his knees and he would recite the entire Lord's Prayer. Then he would crawl up to the next and he would do it again. Step after, it took hours. I won't even tell you the condition of his knees when he got to the top. Finally, aching bones, he struggles to stand. He turns and he looks down the long steps. And he is recorded to have said, who knows if it's true. I wonder if I learned anything, if I earned any time off of my sentence. See, he believed that every step would reduce his purgatory sentence by nine years. And at the end of it, he says, huh, I wonder if it worked. Can you think of anything more binding to live in chains, wondering, were you good enough today to earn God's salvation? Were you good enough today that the grumpy old man in the sky with the magnifying glass says, okay, I won't burn your feelers off like we did with ants? See, he struggled with a dilemma. That's a dilemma that has plagued us to this day, wondering, God, have I done enough good things? Have I said enough right things? Have I done these things? Have I acted in enough things? Or is there something more? And I want to tell you, the religious leaders of Jesus' day had the same problem. And people today have the same problem. And yes, I'm here to tell you the good news. Yes, there's something more. There is a better way. Today we're going to look at the difference between man's religion, which is our attempt to reach up to God, and true faith, Christianity, which is God's attempt saying, you can't reach me on your best day, therefore I will provide a way to reach to you. And there is a huge difference between religion and Christianity. And we're going to look at that today. We're going to be in Mark chapter 2. We're continuing on. We're going to be going verse by verse today. And we're going to look at how Jesus handled the religious elites, because you know how I love how Jesus just spanks these guys. It's just, it's so awesome. It's genius. All right, let me set the context of what we're about to read, because if you're new to the faith, I, I love that we see so many new people each week, and I hear people online and saying, hey, I'm just checking you out. I don't know how I found you guys. It's not an accident, right? So if you're new to this, you haven't heard the story, this is a trippy story. Jesus is preaching. He's in a house, and it is jam-packed. People have packed this place in. People believe it's probably Peter's house based on some context clues. And he's sitting there teaching, 
and people are gathered in. They're trying to get in the doors and the windows, and they, everybody just wants to hear them teach. It's amazing. But these four friends have a buddy who's paralyzed, and they want him so bad to be able to get to Jesus, but they can't because the doors are filled with people. Choose me, and they can't get them in, and they're getting frustrated. So they do the unthinkable. Each one grabs a side of the stretcher and gets up on Peter's roof and begins to tear the roof open to drop this guy down in front of Jesus while he's teaching on the stretch. Can you imagine? Like, and so you've heard it said, what in the world? <laughs> what? I mean, imagine, put yourself there. Like, we just read it like it's dusty history. It's, this is real. This has happened. And they drop him down. And can you imagine? All eyes look at that stretcher coming down from the roof. And they look at Jesus. What is he going to do? How is he going to handle this? This is incredible. Check out his response. That's where we pick up the story. Mark 2, verse 5. Read with me. And when Jesus saw their faith, the faith of these four friends, right? Drop them down. He says to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Oh, but the religious elites were there, the scribes, some of the Pharisees, right? They're sitting there questioning in their hearts. Okay, so it's not out loud, right? It's just kind of, we perceive it. Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God himself, God alone? Okay, did you catch it? Notice the focus here. Notice that Jesus is concerned with this man's heart. Jesus is concerned about this man. But the teachers of the law, what are they concerned about? They are concerned about some violation of an unwritten code at this point. Check out Jesus' reply. Again, I love how he just cuts through the noise and he spanks these guys who are trying to bully him, right? Keep reading. Verse 8, he says, why do you question these things in your heart? So he knows what's in their heart, which is easier to say to the paralytic. Your sins are forgiven, or to say, hmm, rise up, take up your bed, and walk. But, he knew what they are thinking, so that you may know that the Son of Man does have the authority on earth to forgive sins. He says to the paralyzed man, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Can you imagine? I love how the message translation, look at it in this one, it says, Jesus knew right away what they were thinking. And he says, why are you so skeptical? Which is simpler to say to the paraplegic, I forgive your sins, or to say, get up, take your stretcher, and start walking? Well, you know what? Just so it's clear that I am the Son of Man, and I'm authorized to do either or both, he looked now at the paraplegic, get up, pick up your stretcher, and go home. And the man did it. He got up, he grabbed his stretcher, he walked out with everyone there watching him. They rub their eyes. They're stunned. And then they praise God saying, we have never seen anything like this. <laughs> you think? I bet. I bet this was mind blowing. Well, this is, is this Billy Bob? The guy who's been like paralyzed for life? Did he just get up and walk out of here? But they knew these people. It wasn't a huge city. They were able to like, we know this guy. He has been paralyzed for life. And he just, we saw, you saw, right? You know, okay. He got up and he walked out. They walk, it's incredible. Can you imagine? It? Jesus heals him. And then almost as if, like, humorously to prove his point that the guy's healed, he says, oh, hey, don't forget your bed. Right? He's walking out. And he rolls it up. And he's just sitting there like, okay, um, Jesus, I can't believe you did this. Thank you so, so much. I'm going to take my bed. And I'm going to go home. And he stuns the religious people, the elites. Imagine sitting there. These people who are more concerned about some technicality of, why am I holding this? Some technicality in the law, and Jesus is concerned about their heart. Do you see the difference between Christianity and religion? Okay, that is a glaring, and that is our first difference. Religion is sterile, while Christianity is spiritual. It cares about the heart. It actually matters what people go through and how they are dealing with things. It's not just a bunch of do's and don'ts, but the religious teacher of the law didn't care about those spiritual concerns. Do you know people like that today? We still see this. This is why it's so important for us to love first and then to demonstrate what holiness and a lifestyle of true following Christ looks like. They said, Jesus, you can't do this. And Jesus says, really? So that you know I have the power to forgive sins, I'm actually going to not only heal him spiritually, I'm going to heal him physically. And it blew their minds. Religious elites don't like that. Maybe you've seen it. Maybe you've been hurt in the church. Maybe you've seen some religious people who have been offended by musical styles. 
from technicality, rather than the fact that people are getting to the throne of God and worshiping. You've heard people, maybe in religious pontificating churches, that they didn't approve of maybe a translation. The pastor didn't use my favorite Bible translation, ignoring the fact that God is openly ministering through the word. Maybe you've seen people come in and you felt the icy stares of someone who shows up with tattoos, facial piercings, and bizarre looks. Never mind in the fact that that is a new believer in Christ. Oh, and he just brought three more friends with him who need to know Jesus. But the religious elite said, oh, they don't look like us. They don't talk like us. They don't smell like us. But Jesus would have a field day. You see that? The biggest fight I've ever seen in a church was whether at a budget meeting they should buy four large garbage cans or one dumpster. God help us. If that is what we are concerned about. Pharaoh C. See the legalism? That's another thing. Religion is filled with pride. It's about us. Christianity, it's about people. Christianity loves people right where they are. Cares enough about them not to leave them where they are, but to disciple them to being a fully devoted follower of Christ. Jesus just called a new guy named Matthew. Your Bible calls him Levi if you're reading in Mark. Matthew Levi was a tax collector. He was hated. Again, if you've not heard this before, tax collectors were on the bottom of the rung. They were hated, okay? Like, like you would have average people, then kind of like the losers that no one wanted. Then below them, you would have thieves, then prostitutes, then murderers, then Duke and Auburn fans, and then tax collectors, all right? Just say it, just so you can kind of put it. I'm just kidding. Too soon? Sorry. Just. They were hated worse than we feel about IRS agents. You know why? Because the IRS agents and the, uh, the Roman people, there was a tax, and they paid it, they got it. But these tax collectors were allowed to add whatever they wanted on top of the Roman tax, and they could take it home in their pockets at the end of every day. And no one could do a thing about it. You see why they were hated? They did not like these guys. Everyone hated them, especially Matthew. But not Jesus. Jesus not only didn't hate them, Jesus calls them to be one of his disciples. Are you crazy? This guy, you can't do it. The scriptures say he's not only one of the sinners, he's among the notorious sinners, right? And you know what's bad when you are notorious for your sinners, right? Not just a Duran Duran song. It is a description. You are notorious, okay? Now notice, keep reading. Notice the response of these religious elite to Jesus being invited to Matthew's house for a dinner party. When the teachers of the religious law, who were Pharisees, there they are, Pharisees saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners. They asked his disciples, why does he do that? Why does he eat with such scum? <laughs> Isn't that great? Scum. I've been called a lot of things. That's probably one that's missed me right now. Scum. Can you, do you hear the arrogance? Can you sense the dripping condom, uh, uh, con, what's condensation? No, that's, that's a... Uh, Condemnation. Can you sense that word dripping from them? Their pride, it is so arrogant. They call them scum. Scum. In fact, I think we actually have an actual photo of that moment where the oldest Pharisee, yep, there it is, right? You will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. Bonus points for the Star Wars reference. Do you see what's happening here? These religious elites did not care that Matthew got saved. They cared that he was hanging out with sinners. They didn't give a rip about him. They didn't care the fact that God was working on their hearts or these people have been far from God all their lives and here they are. The guy we hate is coming to know Jesus. No! That can't happen. You know people like that? Oh, man. God, would you save that? Well, not, not, don't, like, save him. So he's here? Oh, come on. Man, that guy doesn't shout. He stinks. Religious people reveal their heart very quickly. They don't care. See, to them, this guy didn't look like him. He didn't talk like them. He didn't think like them. The religious people are so full of pride. So check out how Jesus responds. I love it. Keep reading. Verse 17. When Jesus heard this, he said, hey, guys, uh, 
Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I've come not to call those who think they are righteous, right? You could just see them kind of like pointing at them. <laughs> but those who know they're sinners. I didn't call for the, I'm not here to those prideful people like you. Those who are humble and they know they need a savior. The ones who would come on bended knee and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Don't you just love how Jesus turns the tables on these guys? Notice that Jesus never spanked those who were hurting. I love that. He never spanked those who were coming to him for salvation. He never, you know, used that biting sarcasm on those who came asking for wisdom. He always reserved it for the religious elites. That is very revealing. Lord, forgive me if I ever come across as a religious elite. Jesus said, I'm going to those who don't have it all together, not those who think they do. You want to push them away. Jesus says, I'm here to draw them close. You're concerned about their social status. I'm concerned about their status before the Father. You're concerned about their external appearance. I'm concerned that their internal heart is cleansed. We see this today, even among spiritual people. As much as I hate to admit it, I remember hearing a story about a seminary student years ago who was literally kicked out of Bible seminary because he would go down to the local pool hall to share the gospel. Can you imagine? In fact, we have an actual photo of that too. Look at that. We do. It's incredible. This is when he came to talk to Tom Cruise and Paul Newman. And he's here talking to him. And the seminary literally said, you must stop going to that place to share the gospel or you will be removed from enrollment. This Bible seminary guy didn't even have to think about it. He said, guys, I refuse to obey what you're saying because you have taught me these are the very people you're trying to reach. And I'm doing that and you don't care. We still see it today. That's not true Christianity. True Christianity is about it doesn't care about what you've seen and done in your past and where you've been, your status in society. It doesn't care about your money. It doesn't care about your skin color. It doesn't care about any of that. Jesus cares about the heart. Religious people are all hung up on these other things. And here's another huge difference. Religion focuses on the form, not Christianity. Christianity focuses on the function, the actual event. There's a great old story that illustrates this perfectly. And it tells the story of an old farmer named Olay. And when Olay got up in years and he finally neared retirement age, he decided to sell the farm and move to an entirely new city. And when he got there, he discovered he was the only Baptist in this new town of 100% Catholics. He said that was fine, but then the neighbors began to have a problem because every Friday he would barbecue beef in his backyard and Hayden, the doctor of deliciousness, would help. Come up, and he would be, no, that part's not true, I'm just saying. He would come up, and he would barbecue this beef, and the smell would waft over his fence into the backyards of the entire street. And it drove these Catholics nuts, because in that time, they were not allowed to eat meat on Fridays. Okay? So this was a, a big deal. They were beside themselves, so they got together, and they came and confronted Olay. And they said, Olay, we love you, but let's be honest. You are the only Baptist in this whole town. There's not a Baptist church for miles. We think it's time that you join our church and become a Catholic. And Olay thought about it and said, okay, maybe you're right. So they said, fantastic. They went and they talked to the priest. They had it all arranged. The big day came and the priest had Olay kneel. In the big performance of a ceremony, he put his hand on Olay's head. He said, Olay, you were born a Baptist. You were raised a Baptist. And now, and he sprinkled some holy water over his head, he said, you are a Catholic. And everybody cheered. It was incredible. It was a big day. They hugged her. They were so excited to have a lay part of their faith. Until Friday, when yet again, the smell and aroma of beef was coming from Olay's backyard, and the grill was wafting through the, the neighborhood, and they were going berserk. And they said, that's it. Let's confront them. And they go, and as they near Olay's backyard at the fence, they hear him saying something strangely familiar to the stake. You were born a beef. You were raised a beef. And then sprinkling salt over the meat, he said, but now you are fish. <laughs> and we, 
And we think that's a silly story. <laughs> but we do the same thing. Y'all, there is so much truth to this when it comes to religion. So many times we are concerned with form over function. I've been guilty of it. I remember hearing a Christian once at a gathering at the end and the minister prayed. And someone literally said, did he say in Jesus' name? Because if he didn't say in Jesus' name, then the prayer is invalid. <laughs> God doesn't hear that. You better go add that. And they were serious. Like, like it's a coda that you have to add in order for the prayer to be valid. Another true story of a guy who was baptized. When the pastor put him under, just a little bit of his arm did not make it under the water and it remained dry. The following Sunday in a Sunday school class, they literally had to debate, was this baptism actually valid? And that pastor bit his tongue, but he so, he said, I wanted to say, it's not. His arm went to hell, but the rest of them made it. He wanted so badly to say that, just to illustrate the idiocy of that. Y'all, Jesus would call that pharisaical, legalism. And there's nothing more binding to your heart. Jesus came to set us free from the bondage of rules and regulations and sin. Are we supposed to live a life of holiness? Absolutely. Out of love for what he's done, for who he is. Not because he's mad and he's going to beat us. There's a difference between religion and true faith. It's so ridiculous what we do sometimes. But wait, there's more. Looking at the scripture, Jesus has more great people that he comes in contact with. Keep reading, okay? The disciples, they don't like that he's not fasting, right? Uh, with the uh, Pharisees and like the John the Baptist did. So in verse 19, Jesus looks and he says this. Guys, can the wedding guest fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The message translation puts it like this. Jesus says, when you're celebrating a wedding, you don't skimp on the cake. <laughs> can you imagine? It's a wedding. No cake for you. It's like, no, it's a party. You're here to celebrate. He goes on and says, you don't, you, you feast, right? Later, you might need to pull in your belt. I get that, right? But not now. Now the bride and the groom, they're with you. Have a good time. No one throws cold water on a friendly bonfire. This is the kingdom come. What is he saying? He's saying the issue to them, it wasn't about fasting. It wasn't fasting just to fast. There's a time and a place for that. It is absolutely scriptural. There's no problem. But Jesus is saying, guys, the bridegroom is with you. I am here in their midst. You're going to have me for just a few more days, and then I'm gone. Now is the time to say, you got plenty of time to fast. But I'm with you. This is the party. Jesus is making it clear. Christianity is more concerned with function, and there is a time and a place for everything, but the religious people are concerned with the form. And it always comes up empty. The next thing we see the difference, religion is based on rules. Christianity is based on a relationship. If you've been coming here for any time, you've heard me say that a hundred times. Christianity is a relationship between you and the Savior. I heard a great story just this past week of a young woman who was preparing her famous pot roast. And her friend was over there, and they were just talking. And she said, wait, 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 wait. So back up. You just did something weird. What? Why, did you, why did you cut the ends off of your giant pot roast and just throw them away? And she said... I don't know. My mom always did it that way. That's, I'm, next time I see my mom, I'm going to ask her why we do that. That's just a recipe. We did it, we prepare it, we put it in the pot, we put it in the oven, and, and ask her. Her friend's question made her curious, so she goes, she visits her mom, and she says, hey, mom, how do you cook a pot roast? And her mom explained, and he says, well, the first thing you do is you cut off both ends, then you prepare it, you put it in the pot, and then you put it in the oven, and it goes, no, 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 back up. Why do we cut the ends off the roast? And the mom thought for a minute. She says, I don't know. And she was baffled. She said, that's how my mom did it, and I learned from her. So these two said, Grandma's still with us. So we've got three generations. They said, let's go talk to Grandma. When we visit her, we'll find out. So they went, and they talked to her. And Grandma, she was in a nursing home, and she, she, was, she was still alert. She said, Mom, will you tell me how to cook your favorite pot roast? And the mother slowly answered. She says, well, you prepare it with the spices. You know, then you cut off both ends and you put it in the pot. And they looked at each other and said, Mom, why do you cut off the ends of your pot roast like that? And she thought about it, and then her eyes sparkled as she remembered. She says, well, the roasts were always much bigger than the pot that I had. 
So I just cut it off to fit it in the pot. These people have been doing this for centuries, for, for, for generations. They've got plenty of big pots, yet they're still butchering this roast and throwing it away. Do you see how this happens? There are so many times we follow rules, we don't even know why we're following them. This is so applicable to us. This is what the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the cave, they were famous for making up rules about rules. Okay? What, what I mean by that is this. Okay? They would take a legitimate instruction from God. And then they would take it and add additional requirements around it. Man-made rules, legalism, to put them back in bondage so they would have power and control. Here is a perfect example of it. Look with me at verse 23. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees, isn't it funny that the Pharisees are always right there? It's like they're walking. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> right? And it's like, I'm just like... What is it with these guys? Why are they always there? The Pharisees were saying, oh, da, 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 look, 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 look. Why are you doing what's not lawful on the Sabbath? Of course, this is a ridiculous assertion. They're talking to Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, by the way. They weren't breaking any laws at all. And Jesus quickly, again, spanks them, reminds them that King David, in effect, had done the very same thing. And then he makes this statement. He says, guys, the Sabbath was made for man. Not man for Sabbath. You got it backwards. So the Son of Man is Lord of even the Sabbath. In other words, he's saying, guys, the Sabbath laws were given to benefit you. They were given to benefit humankind and our relationship with the Father. It wasn't meant to be a club that you beat people over the head with like you religious fanatics have been doing. All you do, you focus on religion. You, you look at the Christian life of nothing but a, a list of don't do this. You better do that. Oh. Do that? Oh, don't do that. Da, 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 da. Jesus says, I'm not an ogre. I didn't come for that. I came to set you free. This is not about doing this or that so that you could be pleasing to God and he's not angry with you. That is a horrible way to live the life of freedom in Christ. In fact, it'll do more to pull you away from him. I've known people like that and you probably have too. There was a, a famous British conglomerate. In fact, we're, we're gonna, I'm going to park here early today. So, band, you guys can go ahead and come on up as I share this, this final story. All these great British thinkers, religious elites, had gathered in England, and they were sitting around the table, and they were debating what, if any, belief was unique and special about the Christian faith among the world religions, okay? So they're having the debate, religious elites, I would hate this conference, oh my goodness. And they're talking about, well, what about this world religion, and what about that? And they're just jawing, talking about does Christianity even have anything that stands out? Is there anything singularly unique? And someone said, absolutely, the incarnation. And they got to talk and they said, well, that's not really true because there's different versions, different gods appearing to people. They always have that. The resurrection. No, again, other religions have accounts of people returning from death. And the debate went on and on. It started to get heated and louder and louder. And unbeknownst to them, the legend himself, this man, walked down the hall and entered the room, the great C.S. Lewis. And he is literally quoted, here's his exact words, Sirs, what is all this rumpus about? And the room got quiet, and they stared at the great C.S. Lewis, and all the colleagues said, we're discussing the unique contribution among world religions, and we wanted to know if Christianity had anything different to add. And C.S. Lewis, without missing a beat, says, absolutely. That's easy. It's grace. It's grace. And he turned and he left. And they were stunned in silence. They looked at each other. They thought about it. And then they all had to come to an agreement saying, he's right. The notion of God's love coming to us free of charge, already paid for, no strings attached, goes against every instinct of us. Every instinct of humanity to want to work. We feel like uh, it can't be that easy. I've got I've to complicate it, right? I've got to make it more. Uh, certainly I've got to... Your job is repentance. God's already paid that. He's the perfect sacrifice. Every other faith, the Buddhist with the eightfold path, the Hindus with karma and reincarnation, the Muslim code of law, every one of those is an attempt to earn God's approval. C.S. Lewis came in and said, guys, you can't earn God's approval. It's already taken care of. It's grace. Only Christianity dares to come and show God's love unconditionally 
offered to all who will receive that relationship. So what about you? Have you received it? See, religion will always lead you down a road that's dead-ended. There's no hope. There's no relationship. But Christianity, following Jesus, we have the opportunity to know and experience God's love in a real, tangible way, to spread that love to the world around you. That's the next step, to spread that love. As followers of Christ, we're supposed to be sharing that love with others. Last week, I challenged you to that. Remember that? I prayed, would you ask the Lord to put one person on your heart? As Easter comes up, I put that stat up. Eight out of ten people who would normally not go to church will say yes if somebody invites them to an Easter service. Many of you came down and we prayed, God, would you put one person on our heart? Some of you had more. Several people put on your heart. That's awesome. Maybe you didn't take that challenge. To you, I ask that question. Are you sharing God's love with anyone? How are you doing with that? You have a chance. We're going to pray about that today. We're going to open the altar, and I want you to pray, God, is there somebody who needs to know your love that I'm missing, that I'm overlooking, or that I've been hesitant to talk to? This past week, we've had family fly in from all over, and it's been a challenge. God's called me to love them. God's called them to love others. You to love your sphere of influence. How are you doing with that? Would you bow with me? Let's just pray for a moment. Father, during these next few moments, would you have your way with us? Bring to our heart, to our mind, somebody that we need to lay before your throne, that we would be intercessory prayers, that we would breathe these prayers frequently during the day and lay their name before your throne. God, put somebody in our path. Orchestrate this divine appointment over the next 21 days before we celebrate your resurrection. God, would you just make it obvious. Put us on a collision course with somebody. Already we pray that you are preparing their hearts to soften the soil so they will receive the good news. Use us, Lord. Help us not to be content to sit, but to serve. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. The altar will be open. The words will be on the screen. If God's laid somebody in your heart, maybe you want to come and kneel and just lift them up. Maybe you've got a friend who's lost, a family member. Maybe you've got an upcoming decision to make. This is your time. Respond as the Lord leads.